All right, good morning, everyone. I want to thank the organizers here for uh, inviting me to come and give some lectures on lattice supersymmetry. Uh, gets me out of Syracuse for a week in winter, which is always a, a good thing. Um, so here's my plan for the next uh, uh, three lectures. So, so this is roughly going to be what I'd like to try and cover. So today we'll probably get to the first uh, three or four points, bulleted points in this, in this list. So I'm going to start with a brief, very brief motivation for why we might be interested in putting supersymmetric theories on lattices. I'll sketch again very briefly what the traditional difficulties have been in doing that. Um, and I'll sort of outline what has been uh, the general strategy that uh, uh, people have pursued in recent years in trying to get around some of those difficulties. Um, so specifically, I'll talk about something called topological twisting. Uh, that's a, a notion that you can come up with in the continuum, but it turns out to be very useful in discretizing uh, supersymmetric theories so that you can study them on lattices in a way which at least conserves some uh, of the supersymmetry charges. Um, so I'll, I'll start off in a, in a sort of, these lectures are meant to be, I think, be fairly pedagogical, so I'll start off uh, in a, with a toy model, essentially quantum mechanics, supersymmetric quantum mechanics, and I'll show how it works in that simple situation, uh, and then we'll move on to discuss gauge theories. Initially, I'll start off with sort of the prototypical example, which is uh, n equals two Young-Mills theory with four superchargers, four real superchargers in two dimensions. We'll see that once we understand how to do that, the transition to more complicated and interesting theories in higher dimensions is relatively straightforward. Um, so that will be really the goal of today, I think. Um, tomorrow we'll move on to perhaps the most interesting of these theories that's been studied so far, which is n equals four super young mills in, in, in four dimensions. And when, I, when we come to talk about that, I'll have to discuss the renormalization of that theory, what we know about that, uh, how we can get back the additional supersymmetries which are not maintained by a lattice discretization procedure, and how we can conceive of uh, tuning to recover a supersymmetric continuum limit corresponding to the full n equals 4 theory. Uh, I'll mention briefly some of the problems in doing simulations here. So some of the motivation, of course, of constructing lattice theories is so you can study them at strong coupling using numerical simulation techniques. And so I'll spend some time um, talking about what are the potential problems there, how many of those problems we can get around, or we think we can uh, get around at this point, and what remaining problems there still are to deal with. Um, and so in the last lecture, I'll, I'll sort of generalize the constructions a little bit and talk about quiver gauge theories and how we can use quiver gauge theories to target more interesting theories like super QCD, at least in dimensions less than four. Uh, and then I'll have some brief comments about holography towards the end. I won't show you many numerical results. In fact, virtually no contemporary numerical results in these lectures. I'll leave that to some of the people who are talking in uh, some of the research talks later in the week. So I will not get... Uh, uh, sort of preempt them on those sort of things, but I'll just sketch out some of the um, ideas that have been used to explore holography using these lattice simulations. So since this is very pedagogical, please stop me at any point and ask questions. I haven't got that many slides, so if you don't stop me, we might end early, which is probably a good thing anyway. All right. That's for three lectures. This is the whole set, right? I may, I may add a few more yet. I haven't actually finished, but... Uh, that's the ballpark, so we don't have that many slides. All right, so what I won't have time for, um, I will say almost nothing about n equals one super young mills. Uh, I know there are various people like Andreas and Georg who are going to talk about uh, n equals one and, and related issues in, in the research talk, so I'll leave that to them. Um, I won't say much about West Sumino models and Sigma models. Those were studied a lot in the early days of this field. Uh, but I, 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 for reasons of uh, uh, shortness of time, I won't have time to talk about them today. They don't add much new to what I'm going to say anyway. So I, I think for the moment they can be left out. Um, as, you, as you see as we go along, uh, some of the, well, the gauge theories that we'll be talking about um, were originally constructed using uh, orbifold deconstruction methods by David Kaplan, Mithat Unsel, and, and various other people in the audience. Um, I will refer to those as we go along, but I will not go through the details of those constructions, primarily because 
it would take a lot of time. And at the end of the day, uh, one of the uh, interesting aspects of all of this is that the, those constructions turn out to be essentially equivalent to the sort of uh, topologically twisted constructions I will concentrate my time on. So we won't, in the end, get to a different point by talking about orbifolds. Um, so I will only refer to them in sort of in passing. Um, and I certainly won't talk about any new ideas that people have been playing with in the context of lattice supersymmetry, like tensor network real realizations and things like that, although that looks very interesting to me, uh, particularly for working at strong coupling. I don't think anyone's talking about that here, but I, I, uh, I know Cato had a very interesting recent paper on the West Umino model and tensor representations, which I think would be is something that I'm personally interested in. So there have been quite a few reviews over the years on this stuff. I, I just listed a couple here. Uh, which cover certainly all the material, or most of the material I'll, I'll talk about today. Um, I haven't had time to prepare, uh, to prepare a really uh, exhaustive bibliography, so I'll try to do a bit more of that as we go along here. Uh, but so most of my slides won't have paper references and things like that unless they happen to be there from some earlier iteration of the talk, uh, of the slide. But I'll try to improve that as we go along. All right, um, so what's the motivation for putting supersymmetric theories on lattices? Uh, well, probably in this audience, I don't really need to belabor this very much. Uh, supersymmetric theories, of course, have much improved UV behavior over their non-supersymmetric cousins. Um, in some sense, uh, light scalars are rather natural in supersymmetric theories, and in the past, that was used as a strong motivator for cons constructing you know, semi-realistic models of things like electroweak symmetry breaking. Of course. Right now, I guess that's somewhat of a moot motivation, so I won't, I won't uh, stress it now. Of course, they, they certainly afford very interesting, uh, tractable, analytical uh, models which resemble QCD. So they've been often posited as toy models for understanding things like confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. And so that's one motivation for trying to understand them also in the context of lattice physics. Uh, they're, of course, a key component of string theory. They remove the tachyon from the bosonic string. And perhaps most importantly, uh, they may tell us something about gravity through the ADS-CFT correspondence, or more general in terms of gauge gravity dualities. And so that's something I think which is sort of a, these days, the primary motivation for trying to understand uh, supersymmetric Young Mills theories. Um, if certainly if you're model building, you have to break supersymmetry at low energy because the, the low energy world is manifestly not supersymmetric. And so, Typically, because of various non-renormalization theorems, that can't occur in perturbation theory. And so one's motivated to look for some sort of non-perturbative tool, and the lattice naturally emerges in that context. So that's a sort of a, an additional motivation for um, constructing supersymmetric theories. Perhaps, you know, from my perspective, perhaps the, the strongest reason for trying to construct supersymmetric theories on lattices is that lattice potentially offers you a full non-perturbative definition of what you mean by the supersymmetric theory. Rather than a theory be defined essentially in perturbation theory through Feynman diagrams, if one can write a lattice path integral which is well defined, uh, that allows you to think of the theory outside of that perturbative context. So what we'd like is a, a, a construction which plays the same role for QCD that lattice QCD does in, uh, in giving you an a priori um, definition of what you mean by the theory out, uh, outside of perturbation theory. So this sort of a sort of a constructive argument for why you would be interested in these things, independent of these some more specific sort of model dependent statements. All right, so so why why are we not all studying lattice supersymmetry? Why isn't the lattice community uh, a large part of the lattice community devoted to things like this? Um, it turns out people tried this in the very early days of lattice gauge theory. So you can find papers on lattice on proposals for lattice supersymmetric theories back in the very early 80s, 81, 82. And so there was a flurry of activity early on to try to do it, and then people ran into a series of sort of rather obvious problems as to why it was a difficult thing to do. Um, and it's difficult for, uh, so for, for very obvious reasons. Uh, supersymmetry is an extension of the Poincar ordinary Poincaré symmetry, so it includes things like anti-commutators of the superchargers yielding infinitesimal translations. Okay, and clearly, once you go to a lattice, you no longer have the notion of an infinitesimal translation. And so the classical supersymmetry algebra is sort of immediately not realized once one tries to discretize the theory, seemingly. Just because P appears on the right-hand side of that, that anti-commutator. Um, there's an equivalent way of, of seeing the same thing in a sort of operational sense. And that relates to the fact that the Leibniz rule no longer holds when you replace continuum derivatives by difference operators. Okay. 
Um, and we'll see that explicitly in some of the simple examples I'll go through. That you'll see that, that to show supersymmetric invariance involves essentially collecting terms into total derivatives. And those operations of collecting uh, variations into total derivative terms just fails uh, when you replace derivatives by difference operators. So it's just a restatement of the same problem. Of course, you know that lattice theories typically suffer from things like fermion doubling. If you get the wrong number of fermion states, there's not much chance of maintaining equality between the bosonic and fermionic numbers of degrees of freedom, so that typically will break supersymmetry too. If you get round the doublers by adding in Wilson terms to lift their masses, those Wilson terms will typically break supersymmetry too. So there are lots and lots of ways in which um, a sort of straightforward, naive discretization of a continuum supersymmetric theory will just uh, break supersymmetry from the outset. And of course, once you break it from the outset at the, at the classical level, the quantum theory you will pick up all kinds of SUSY violating operators, uh, very many of them in general for theories with extended supersymmetry, like the theories we'll be talking about here. Um, and generically, some and indeed many of those operators will be called, or we would class as relevant operators. That is, their couplings will have to be tuned with the lattice spacing in order to approach a supersymmetric continuum limit. All right. And so that, in general, is both unnatural and impractical. There are generally too many of these operators, and you certainly couldn't imagine tuning their couplings to remove them in the continuum limit to approach the right fixed point. All right. And so this was a roadblock to really progress in lattice supersymmetry for more than 20 years. Um, and really, it was these new ideas that emerged um, uh, from orbifolding and later from topological quantum field theory that led to a research of resurgence of interest in this whole field and a, a great deal of development over the last decade or so. And so that's what I'll focus most of my energies on in, in these lectures. Okay, so lots of people have contributed to, uh, to the work I'm going to talk about. This is a uh, a subset of those people, it's always dangerous when you try to write a list of names that you'll forget people, particularly people in the audience. So if that's the case, please tell me later and I'll add names to this list. But this was my uh, quick uh, um, run through of the people I could think of immediately who had played a role in developing some or of the ideas I'll talk about. Okay, so let's talk about a specific example which exhibits a lot of the, a lot but not all of the structure we'll need in order to construct realistic supersymmetric gauge theories. So the first thing to do is to, is to think about quantum mechanics, just like we heard yesterday in those lectures, quantum mechanics affords a nice uh, arena to discuss uh, many interesting property, non-perturbative properties. Of, um, and so we'll talk about Witten's supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So, it's, so the, the action we're interested in uh, it's written up here, so I have some scalar kinetic terms, I have some fermion kinetic terms, some interactions between the fermions and the scalars, and a particular uh, form of the scalar potential. So this theory actually has two supersymmetries in the continuum, corresponding to delta A and delta B. So delta A acts on the, co the bosonic coordinate takes me into a fermion, delta B takes me into the other fermion. All right? It's very easy to see when I take two of these variations, so delta A squared or delta B squared, I end up essentially with D by DT on the original field, which of course is the Hamiltonian, so this is indeed a supersymmetry. All right, so Witten introduced this model to try to understand dynamical supersymmetry, supersymmetry breaking in the early 80s. But it's a nice place to start, uh, and it's historically, at least where I started uh, worrying about these uh, issues, uh, when you think about going to the lattice. So we'll take this theory in the continuum, which has these two supersymmetries, and see how well we can do by discretizing this theory. You know, what, what problems we'll encounter, and, and we'll see how we can get around some of those problems. Uh, in, uh, and that will give us a sort of prototype for what we'll have to do in higher dimensions with gauge theories. Right. So let's proceed in a naive way. So let me just take the fields which originally, of course, live in continuous Euclidean time, say, and place them on sites of a one-dimensional lattice. We'll make the lattice periodic. Right? So I'm going to replace integrals over, de over time, over Euclidean time, by summations over these discrete lattice points. I'll introduce a lattice spacing A associated with that. And I'm going to replace derivatives, d by dt's, by symmetric difference operators. All right? At this point, those of you who are lattice, uh, lattice gauge theorists will worry about things like fermion doubling. 
Uh, we'll return to that issue in, in just a moment, but let's not even worry about the fact that this, if I use symmetric difference operators, I expect to see fermion doubling. Let's not even worry about that aspect for the moment. That's not even the primary problem. So in other words, I'm going to, so my symmetric difference operator looks like this. It acts on two uh, lattice field in the, by just taking differences between x of plus a and x of minus a and dividing by two, and here's the lattice spacing little a up the front. So if I go through this, so I just take my, the action I just told you about, this guy, I replace d by dt's by these symmetric difference operators with my fields defined on lattice sites, and then I'd implement one of these uh, supersymmetric variations, say delta a, it's just an exercise you can go through to plug that into the naive lattice action, and you'll find that it's not zero. So why is it not zero? It's not zero because the thing that emerges here is this object here. Now this, in the continuum, if I think of these delta s's as just derivatives, you'll recognize this is a total derivative term, and so this would be the integral of a total derivative, so it would vanish on a circle. Right? So this is, in the continuum, this would just be zero, but on the lattice in general it's not zero because I cannot reorganize these two terms into the, uh, into the say, the, di the difference of something else. So it's no longer a total derivative operator in the same way. So it's simply not zero. So the very, this is the way in which you explicitly see that the Leibniz rule fails on the lattice and therefore supersymmetry fails to, be, to hold for, the la for a naively discretized lattice action. Okay? In fact, this term, you can, if you just plug in powers of A, you'll see this term is of order the lattice spacing. Now, in the classical theory, of course, I'm going to take the lattice spacing to zero to take the continuum limit, and so this breaking term should vanish in the classical theory. That's true, but that's not, of course, good enough because in the quantum mechanics, the fact that this thing is not zero allows for um, Susie violating operators to appear in principle in the action as I... Uh, uh, and those operators will uh, block or prohibit me taking a to zero without some tuning of the theory. So although this is safe at the, in the classical theory, of course, quantum mechanically, this is a bad situation, and one will have to deal with the nature of those quantum corrections, those loop corrections that arise. And in general, they will prevent this theory from being supersymmetric in any kind of simple way. And so you can see this this, 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 this actual model was analyzed in some detail by Joel Geet and Eric Poppets. Uh, if you take the specific case where this uh, potential P has a mass-like term and a 5 fourth interaction, you can go away and compute the one-loop scalar self-energy, right? So there's a one-loop diagram which is superficially divergent even in quantum mechanics, although, as you'll see in a second in the continuum, it actually is finite. So I end up with an integral to do which where I'm putting in some sort of UV cutoff, which is 1 over A here, but otherwise I'm in the continuum. All right, so because of the P minus P symmetry, the leading superficially divergent term actually vanishes, and so there's, but there's a non-zero finite component here, which corresponds to just keeping the mass term in the numerator there. So when I do that integral, you end up with this arc tangent here, all right, and in the limit that just yields, as MA goes to zero, that just yields a contribution which is 6, times the coupling G, the interaction coupling, uh, times terms, times a half, plus order MA. So that's what you get in the continuum theory, supersymmetric continuum theory. When I go to the lattice, I have to replace these integrals in momentum space by summations of a discrete uh, momentum in the Brion zone. The derivatives that arise here, the P's, become these typical sine pi k over L terms in the lattice theory. Right? And at this point, I'm going to get rid of my doublers by adding to the naive mass a Wilson term, which will raise the, the, uh, the uh, dispersion relation to the zone boundary, so that my doubling states that arise at near k equals pi over a are lifted to some non-zero uh, mass. All right? So this is a typical strategy that's used in QCD to, to get rid of the doublers. Uh, there would be uh, additional fermion states that arise in the, when you use the symmetric difference operator. Right. So formally, this expression resembles the continuum expression, except for the fact uh, that you have to modify the, the, the fermion mass term to include this Wilson operator, and then these derivatives in momentum space, instead of just being linear in P, are now these sine functions, these trig functions of the discrete lattice momenta. Right. So when I do this summation, though, what I find is I get twice the contribution I got in the continuum. All right. So immediately you see that 
one-loop corrections in this quantum mechanical theory are producing uh, uh, self-energy, which is twice that which you'd expect in the continuum, and that term will violate supersymmetry, will lead to an explicit violation in the effective action for the theory. It's sort of straightforward to see where this is coming from. Um, the doubling, the doubler states that I, you see, the, the, the term you're trying to shoot for here is actually insensitive to the mass you insert down in the denominator here. So it will pick up the continuum mass here, but it will also pick up the masses of the doublers. So what happens is the doublers are, pl are playing a role in double in, in, inside of this loop because you get the primary fermion contributing and also the doubler fermion too. Right? So these states at the zone boundary, which are naively suppressed, actually come in for small loops, for sm loops in real space as on the scale of the lattice spacing. All right? So what's, what's happening is the doublers have a mass of order 1 upon a, and although they decouple from long distance physics, they come back inside the small loops that occur in lattice perturbation theory. And in fact, they make a mass independent contribution to that uh, self energy term. All right, so they don't decouple. All right. Anomaly or something? I mean, the Wilson term works. This right? is the thing that generates the anomaly in QC. So it's the anomaly problem in QC. Essentially, it's yeah. a, a, another version of that same thing. Right. Without the anomaly, it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a theory, quantum mechanics, which didn't even have divergences, and yet symmetry is broken, right, because of the doublers. Right. So those quantum corrections, of which, in fact, this this one loop diagram is the only dangerous quantum correction to worry about in this theory, actually wreck the naive continuum limit. I simply compute the boson mass and the fermion mass, and I take a to zero. I find that they diverge as a goes to zero. Of course, you can get around it, because once you understand the lattice perturbation theory in the way we've gone through, I can simply add a new counter term to the lattice action, which subtracts off this extra factor of 3G, right? Uh, it should be 3G over 2, actually, but anyway. The extra contribution that we got here, right? So I started off with contribution in the continuum of 3G, and I end up with 6G from the lattice theory, so I can just subtract off the difference as a counter term, and that will be good enough to remove this problem. And if you do that, you'll find that then, then you can take the lattice spacing to zero, and the theory flows to the supersymmetric theory in the, in the infrared. All right. So Susie's broken. If I do this, I've started with a naive latticeization of the theory. I add this one extra counter term. I know exactly what its coefficient should be. And now SUSY, although it's broken at the scale of the lattice spacing, is going to be regained as A goes to zero. And so this is illustrative of a kind of a general approach to the problem. You can take sometimes a naive discretization of the supersymmetric theory, and, if, and sometimes you can just simply fine tune, eliminate, add a series of finite counter terms which have certain coefficients to, to the lattice action and add them in in order to achieve a supersymmetric continuum limit. And in low dimensions, that's not a bad strategy. Typically, the, you only have to look at the superficially divergent diagrams. There are only a finite number of those to do in lattice perturbation theory. You can simply compute them, see what you need to add in order to restore supersymmetry as A goes to zero and just go that route. Right? So in supernormalizable theories, this is, a, this is a strategy that's been pursued in a variety of different models, both in two and three dimensions, as well as in the quantum mechanics case I'm talking about now. All right. But in this case, we can actually do better, and this is where I want to sort of start uh, Sorry, uh, introducing... A question. Yeah. Can, is there a way to just say double the scalars? Can we... Yes, so you're asking, should I, should I introduce a Wilson term for the scalars too? Yeah, uh, that's maybe double one way of generating this counter term automatically. In fact, historically, that's what happened. The, the natural thing to do, since you want to preserve symmetry in the bosonic and fermionic sector, is if you put a doubling term in for the fermions to get rid of the fermion doubles, you have to do something similar for the bosons, right? If you do it naively, you end up with a problem, but if you do it in a careful way, which preserves the symmetry, you actually generate precisely that counter term, and so the theory is well defined. Um, right. Yeah. Strong in the UV. Uh, does the lattice perturbation theory fail to give you the continuum limit? Uh, in this quantum mechanical case, of course, you're you're sort of you're sort of safe because quantum mechanics doesn't really have true divergences, so it's not an issue in quantum mechanics. 
it might be an issue in, in, in four dimensions if you had, and, and so you have to worry about that, right? But, it, but well, let's see now. If you're in a super normalizable theory, then I, I guess you're safe too, because you know there are only a finite number of divergences that are confined to low orders in perturbation theory. So in that case, even at strong coupling, you're safe. What happens in four dimensions, of course, is, is crucial, and, and, and the story is very different there. So. Okay, so I showed you one way to, to, to save the theory. You can simply do a little bit of lattice perturbation theory, figure out what the dangerous terms are, the dangerous diagrams are, what the, and, and simply add counter terms appropriately to cancel them out. And that's one strategy you can pursue. But in this case, you can do something even better. You can, it's, not, uh, it's a small exercise to take, to recast this variation of the, lattice, the naive lattice action I wrote down and see that it's actually the variation under the other supersymmetry of something else. Right? This something else, again, looks like a total derivative term in the continuum. Right? It could be written that way, but on the lattice, it's non-zero. But of course, I could then imagine, and if I do the same thing for the variation delta b, I'll find that it's the delta a variation of the same object, essentially. So of course, if I take linear combinations of the supersymmetry variations, delta a plus i delta b, and I act on the same naive lattice action, I'll find it's the same variation on this operator here, O, which is this uh, term which in the continuum would be a total derivative term. Okay. In other words, if I to, was to add O back into SL, I could find a, an action which was invariant under this linear combination of the original supersymmetries. All right. So in other words, there's a linear combination of delta L to, L to A and delta B, which can be arrived at, and a modified lattice action, which is for which that's an exact symmetry. All right. Sorry. Delta a. You were saying there's an algebraic error? That is entirely possible. <laughs> uh, let's see, delta A plus I delta B. Oh. I don't think so. No, I... Well, let's not get hung up on the algebra. We'll talk later. I think it's okay, actually. All right. I think it's okay. So the price I have to pay is I have to modify the action by adding in a term which would formally be a total derivative, but is not zero in general on the lattice, um, and then modify and take a particular combination of the supersymmetries, and then I can show the, uh, there's a lattice action out there which is, has an exact invariance under this linear combination. You're fine? No, I think it's okay. But we can... All right, so if I do that, okay, so that motivates me to actually take the appropriate linear combinations of the original fermions. So corresponding to delta A, I can construct a fermion which is the psi 1 plus i psi b, and a psi bar which is psi 1 minus i psi b. And I can show very easily that the variation in the boson is just, takes A, phi just goes into a psi. Uh, psi is actually invariant under the supersymmetry, and psi bar goes into this particular combination of the derivative on, uh, on phi plus p primed on phi. So it's just by taking the same, just linear combinations of the original fermions, I can rewrite this new uh, delta symmetry, this guy which is delta A plus I delta B. Right? I can make it act on those fields so that it has this sort of simple supersymmetry variation. And notice something else that's very interesting at this point. If I take the square of this variation, it's actually zero. Right? So delta on phi is psi, delta on phi is zero. That's cl clearly delta squared on phi is zero, delta squared on psi is zero. Delta squared on psi bar is equal to the variation of this, but this vanishes by the equations of motion. So this new supersymmetry is sort of nilpotent on shell. All right? What's really important is, you remember, this is the, essentially the square of a uh, supersymmetry charge. So it's equal to zero. So there's no p on the right-hand side. So what's happened is you found a linear combination of the original supersymmetries of the theory such that there's a subalgebra associated with that linear combination, the subalgebra, the full supersymmetry algebra, such that, that so you've removed translations from the right-hand side. And of course, then there's no immediate conflict with latticization. Right? So, that's the, so the moral of the story is that in certain theories, which have extended supersymmetry more than one supersymmetry, it is possible, as, and we'll have to go through the criteria you need, but it's possible to find linear combinations of the original supercharges, 
which are nilpotent, which avoid this immediate conflict uh, with uh, the supersymmetry algebra, and where, for which you can implement a lattice action, which, which is exactly invariant under those symmetries. So notice that, by the way, you can, if I go back to this, here's my original gradient term, here's my original potential term, I added in this new operator O as part of the requirement. Of course, this now can be written as a perfect square. So the bosonic sector now just looks like the square of some operator, which involves a derivative on phi plus a potential term. And this theory automatically inherits that counter term. In fact, it does much better than just adding the counter term. It's su exactly supersymmetric at any lattice spacing. So it's not just in the A goes to zero limit is well-defined. It's well-defined exactly supersymmetric for any value of the lattice spacing. All right. Good. Okay. So since I mentioned topological field theory, I should sort of say a bit more about how this all relates back to uh, continuum topological field theory. So I notice, so what we found is there's a linear combination of the original supercharges, which is nilpotent. You can actually make it nilpotent off shell, that is without using the equations of motion by adding in an additional auxiliary field. So I can add in another scalar field B, right, and make psi bar just vary into B with B being a singlet under Q. All right. So I can extend the, the, in, the, in the way you would often do for a supersymmetric theory. You can add auxiliary fields to render the uh, symmetry nilpotent, in this case, off-shell. Um, and then using the standard, and, and I should, one, another thing I should say here is that what I've done is absorb the infinitesimal parameter epsilon into the definition of Q, so that now I don't have any epsilons left on the right-hand side. So Q takes me from a boson to a fermion. This makes it look like a BRST charge, of course, and that's partly why I've done it, because a BRST charge, of course, is also nilpotent in the same way. All right. So I can near, now I can rewrite my bosonic sector uh, just by adding this auxiliary field B into it. So when I integrate B out now, I get the square of this guy. So that, uh, that lattice action I just wrote down, the bosonic sector, I can now just get by integrating over B. All right. So I have now an action which is invariant, which is exactly supersymmetric, under this nilpotent, exact nilpotent symmetry involving auxiliary field B. All right, and for, uh, furthermore, the entire action can be written as the Q variation of something, all right, under, the exact, under, under those supersymmetries. So I can recast my entire lattice action now um, as the Q variation of something, just like a gauge fixing term if I was doing BRST gauge fixing. So let's see how that works. Remember, Q on psi bar, if you go back one slide, Q on psi bar is B. So I'm going to generate the B times this term from varying the psi bar. All right, there's a B squared term coming from psi bar variation and B here. So I get that bosonic sector I just wrote down. And then if I do the variation of what's inside of here, I'll get something like delta plus psi plus P double prime psi, which is the fermion action. So the entire lattice action I wrote down before can be written as the Q variation of a lattice object. So this looks like a sort of gauge fixing term. All right. So the action is Q exact, just like a gauge fixing term. And in fact, you can actually, if you want, quotes, derive this action from a BRSD gauge fixing procedure. Suppose I take the simplest action I can think of, S equals zero. Right? It doesn't get any simpler than that. Right? So that's invariant under very wide symmetry. I can take phi and replace it by anything I want. All right? So it has a topological symmetry. I can shift phi by any uh, infinitesimal parameter epsilon. All right? Of course, if I want to write, so that's the classical theory. It's not very interesting. If I want to quantize the theory, of course, I have to pick a gauge. I have to reduce this symmetry down. Right? So one gauge I can pick is the gauge. Uh, which if I have not defined here, let me, so n here is just this combination I wrote down before. So I can pick the gauge n, which is delta symmetric phi plus p primed phi. That's just a gauge condition which fixes the topological shift symmetry. So I start for this topological bosonic theory, invariant in this large symmetry. I pick a gauge function, which is, of so course, related to question. my final action. Is it, is it delta plus there instead of delta symmetric? Oh, I'm, well, sorry. Yes. 
this is something I sort of skipped over. I start with a symmetric difference operator. If I put a Wilson term into P primed, all right, so there's an MW buried inside of a mass term in, in the definition of P prime. This has a mass in it. I'm going to augment that mass with a Wilson term. I can always take that Wilson term, add it to the symmetric difference operator, and get a forward or backward difference operator. So sorry, yeah. So I can write it both ways. I can write this also as, say, something like delta plus phi plus P primed phi. This, if you want, is P prime tilde. It has a Wilson term in it. This one doesn't. All right, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I can pick a gauge, like n equals zero. I can insert that as a getting in the gauge condition. Of course, I have to put in a fatty of pop-off factor to account for the fact that I'm gauge fixing. And then what you see is that the partition function I'm interested in is now an integral of a phi. I have the fatty of pop-off determinant that goes in there, and then an action, which is precisely my bosonic action. So this whole theory I wrote down can be thought of as a gauged fixed version of this um, uh, topological uh, bosonic theory. All right? In fact, it, what you, what's happening now is the sine psi bar, the physical fermions of the quantum mechanical theory, just appear as ghost fields in a particular gauge. Right? And by the way, sometimes this gauge function n, this choice I made over here, it's called the Nikolai map, and there are more things I could say about that, but in the interest of time, I won't say anything more. So there is a sort of an explicit connection to topological field theory here, because I can build a theory out of the... Um, I can construct my supersymmetric theory, whether it be on the lattice or in the continuum, by a, sort of, uh, by a process of gauge fixing of an underlying topological shift symmetry. And one of the, that's exactly how I can get a supersymmetry which has squares to zero. It really is it's possible to think of it as a BRST type of symmetry. All right, but we won't actually use that in any uh, serious way here, but it does mean that the, the lattice theories we construct have a sector inside of them which is purely topological in the sense that there are some states which are, states which are annihilated or operators which are invariant under Q can be computed on an arbitrary manifold and are typically couple and constant independent. That's actually quite nice because it means some of the things we, when we write computer simulation codes, there are sections of the theory where we can compute certain VEVs where we know exactly what the answer is. So we can check our codes very carefully because it has this sort of topological sector built into it. Right. So, but it's very important at this point to stand back and, 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 not, um, and not get confused by this topological aspect. All right? Q looks like a BRS charge, it is true. I can even derive the theory in quotes by choosing an appropriate gauge function from this underlying bosonic topological field theory. But the, when we're using it in the context of constructing supersymmetric lattice theories, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to treat Q as a BRSD charge, right? So I can formally derive by gauge fixing that the lattice theory is not topological. That is, we don't restrict ourselves just to states annihilated by Q, right? So if it was purely topological, then I'd have to restrict myself to only consider states or operators invariant under Q. In this case, we're not making that restriction. That would project us essentially to the vacuum of the theory, which is uh, not what we want to do, all right? So we just use it as a, a sort of a change of variables. So we're going from our original variable psi 1, psi 2, to this particular complex combination. Um, it's just a change of variables, but it's one which exposes this nilpotent symmetry, which is related to the original supersymmetries of the theory. And it's that supersymmetry that we can conserve when we go to the lattice. Notice the theory had two supersymmetries originally. It's only one of them I can conserve. Right? The other one is broken in general at order A. Right? But the hope is that by preserving at least some of the supersymmetries, you remove some of these relevant, dangerous, SUSY violating operators in the lattice effective action, and you ensure that the tuning is reduced or possibly eliminated. In the quantum mechanical case, it's just eliminated. You can now just take A to zero without doing anything. Okay. So it's important to realize that the, this is not just a procedure for constructing a topological field theory on the lattice. It's, we're interested in using it as essentially a, change, a suitable change of variables that makes the, the continuum theory more suitable for discretization, more suitable in the sense that I can now uh, conserve one or more supercharges at non-zero lattice spacing. That's the key. Okay. <clears throat> so, you have essentially two options when it comes to constructing these supersymmetric theories. So this was a toy example, but it illustrates both of those features. Um, if I'm interested in theories like, for example, n equals 1, super Young Mills in four dimensions, 
I, it turns out that theory is, is actually rather simple. There's only a single counterterm you encounter in perturbation theory, basically the Gluino mass, which potentially has to be tuned to take a supersymmetric continuum limit. And so it's quite possible in certain simple theories like n equals 1, Yang Mills in 4D, that you can simply do that tuning and, and, and simulate the theory using essentially uh, a conventional lattice approach. And so what I showed you in the quantum mechanics case is if I figure out what that one counter term is, the structure of it, and it possibly even computed in perturbation theory in less than four dimensions, then that's good enough to take a supersymmetric limit. If so if I'm careful, I can just handle the counter terms directly. Right? In fact, if I use domain wall fermions, you don't even have to do that tuning. You just simply take LS to infinity. That will automatically suppress the Gluino mass. And that has also been explored by various groups over the years. If you're in less than four dimensions, there's only a finite number of these divergences to worry about, and they occur at small numbers of loops, and so it's possible to even calculate them using lattice perturbation theory and just correct your lattice action so you can remove these uh, potentially dangerous terms that obscure the supersymmetric continuum limit. So that's one strategy, and that's a strategy that's been pursued in certain cases um, uh, by various groups over the years. Right? But the quantum mechanics case also shows you that in certain cases you can do better than that you can actually find sub-algebras within the full supersymmetry algebra which are compatible with the lattice directly. All right? And if you can uh, reformulate your theory in, those sort of, in that kind of twisted language in terms of these new variables, then you can actually hope that the, that additional supersymmetry that you conserve will protect the theory at arbitrary lattice spacings, and specifically as I take A to zero. And so that's the strategy that I'm mostly going to talk about in these lectures. All right. So we'll do the analog of this quantum mechanical linear combination. We'll try to find a recipe for generating those linear combinations in more engaged theories and in theories in higher dimensions. All right. And there will be a connection you can make in all of those cases to, uh, to an underlying topological field theory, but that's not something that by itself is less interesting to us than the idea that there is such a combination out there. Those are theories with extended supersymmetry, by the way, so there will be things that will be very difficult to do uh, using this strategy, because once you introduce scalars, it's very hard to protect the scalars except using supersymmetry. And since you've broken supersymmetry, you don't have it. So, for seri although you can get away with n equals 1, using a sort of a, this strategy in four dimensions of just tuning the Gluino mass, that won't work for n equals 2. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is a strategy will work even for extended supersymmetry, as long as, in fact, you need lots of supersymmetry to make it work. All right, so that's the, that's the goal. That's where we're heading. So in, in this quantum mechanics example, there is this other supersymmetry which is not preserved. Right. How do you show that it is uh, restored in the continuum limit? Uh, you can show it in perturbation theory. That's one thing. You can certainly do simulations and show that it's also fine. Um, once we've c removed the one supersymmetry breaking term with this counter term, then you can show just in perturbation theory the other one is safe. And that's been explored extensively by, uh, by various groups over the years. Yeah. So it just comes back for free in that case. You can't write down basically an operator, a relevant operator if you want, which violates the second supersymmetry but is allowed by the first. So if you preserve the first, you, you eliminate all the danger operators for the second. And, and you can do that in sort of power counting perturbation theory. All right, so, so the key idea is try to preserve some subset of the supersymmetry algebra when you go to the lattice. And you hope that this helps to at least reduce the number of relevant operators that break the full supersymmetry. Right? In some cases, it eliminates all of those relevant operators. In other cases, it at least reduces the set down to a more, more manageable set. Uh, and the, the key to finding this subset, this nilpotent subset of the supersymmetry algebra, is this idea of topological theory, twisting. So I mean, this will become this is something we're going to focus on. And the idea is just to reformulate the theory in new variables that automatically exposes a scalar supercharge. And there's a well-defined procedure in higher dimensions for doing that, and so that's what I illustrate. So typically in these uh, twisted formulations, Q squared is zero, at least up to gauge transformations, and typically also the action is Q exact. So this property we saw was true for the quantum mechanical action. It turns out to be quite generically true. Right? So, so the actions for these twisted theories in the continuum can be written as Q on something. Uh, with a few caveats, right? So if I can keep Q squared equals zero um, in the lattice theory, then the invariance of S is guaranteed. So if I can maintain this algebra basically on the lattice, then since the action now has this form, 
then the theory can be is automatically invariant without invoking uh, anything like the Leibniz rule. Okay. All right, so let's move on to a concrete example of a gauge theory in two dimensions where you can play this role, and this will illustrate most of the features that we'll need uh, to understand theories in four dimensions too. So, so this is n equals two Young Mills in two dimensions. So it has a gauge field, the field condon, two real scalars, and two Majorana fermions. So again, it has extended supersymmetry. That's going to be a crucial feature. So its action looks has a Young Mills term, F squared, a, you know, a kinetic term for the scalars. There's some interactions for the scalars, and there are some fermionic pieces too. So some kinetic terms for the fermions and Yukawa's. All right. So. So this is the generic theory in conventional variables that we're interested in discretizing onto the lattice. But it turns out that the important thing now is to uh, figure out what the global symmetries of the theory are. So clearly it has, we're in Euclidean space, it has an SO2 Lorentz symmetry. I can do rotations in the base space. It also has an additional SO2 R symmetry, which you can think of as just rotating the two Majorana fermions into each other. So I have two degenerate Majorana fermions, so clearly I can do linear combinations of them, rotations into each other. So it has at least this symmetry. In fact, it has an additional SO2 symmetry too, but I don't even need that for the twisting procedure I'm going to describe. All right. So it has at least SO2 cross SO2. So under these symmetries, what happens? The fermions transform with a factor which does the Lorentz rotations and a factor which does the R symmetry or the flavor rotations. Okay? So typically the fermions carry a Lorentz index and a flavor index, and they transform according to those two SO2, independent SO2 rotations, right? So I can just rewrite that in a trivial way. It's just L psi R transpose. So the idea of, uh, of twisting is, is to focus in on a subset of this full global symmetry, so-called twisted rotation group, where I take L equal to R. So I'm going to consider only symmetries now, where I, which I do an equal rotation in the base space as in the flavor space. Right? So what you see is when I take L equals R, this means that transforms like L psi R L transpose, so it transforms like a matrix under the twisted rotation group. Right? So the key is to focus in on a subgroup of the full global symmetries so that the fermions transform in a very different way than they would as spinners under the usual Lorentz group. Right? So this is what will happen in higher dimensions. In quantum mechanics, you don't see this structure because there's no rotation group to talk about. But in high dimensions, this is the strategy for getting these nilpotent supercharges. All right. So what started off as uh, a spinner with a flavor index, now I can think of it essentially as a two by two matrix. All right. And it's very easy to see the original action now can be written as the trace of the contraction of that of gamma dot D with the, the psi and psi bar, okay. those two by two matrices. So this is just a simple re re rewriting of the original action under the, twisted, under the action of the twisted rotation group. So once I have a matrix, of course, it's natural to expand that matrix out on products of gamma matrices. That's the first thing you think, think, think of. And then these components, eta, psi, a, and chi, chi, a, b, if you want, are just anti-symmetric tensors. They're anti-symmetric because they're products of gamma matrices. Right? So the original uh, four degrees of freedom in my two Majorana fermions are sort of repackaged out as a scalar piece, eta, which is proportional to the unit two by two matrix, something proportional to gamma matrices, like, like a vector, psi a, and then there's a single, uh, if you want, field, chi one two, which is proportional to gamma five. Remember, we're in two dimensions. All right? So I can just, this is just a decomposition of my matrix. All right? So if I stuff that decomposition into this and do the traces over the gamma matrices, what I find is my action, my original uh, action, just decomposes into something like this. And this is called the Kähler Dirac action. So it involves contracting P form valued Grassmann fields, which come from the original fermions, in the natural way through anti symmetric covariant derivatives. So this is just a rewriting of my original action in such a way that it exposes a scalar fermion. That's the key, the propor thing proportional to the unit matrix. That scalar fermion is what will guarantee there's a scalar supercharge in the theory. But you see it's a scalar not under the original Lorentz symmetry, but under this twisted flavor Lorentz symmetry. Right. It's, it's a trace over the indices. This is a two by two matrix. 
in, oh, did my trace change? It should be the same trace, actually. There's no significance between small t and capital T. Sorry. <laughs> That's the problem with putting things together from different slides where you change notation between talks. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so just as another way of say, saying the same thing, my fermions were spinners under the Lorentz symmetry and spinners under the flavor symmetry, but when I decompose them in the diagonal subgroup, I'm, it's essentially like angular momentum, adding angular momentum in quantum mechanics, I end up with, with things which are integer spin under the twisted rotation group. Remember, this is just a change of variables. I haven't done anything fundamental here. I'm just focusing in on a subgroup with the full global symmetries. Right? So if I was uh, in flat space, in the continuum, the physical content of this theory is the same. It looks different, but it's just a change of variables. Right? I'll show you that explicitly in just a second, actually. So if you're, you're, so I've recast the fermion action in terms of new degrees of freedom, which are linear combinations of the, the, the spinner components I originally had in the theory. Right? It's not, it would not transform well under the original Lorentz symmetry, but it does transform uh, uh, covariantly under the twisted Lorentz group. The bosons, it's a similar game. So what happens? The gauge fields are undisturbed by the twisting because the gauge fields were singlets under the R symmetry, so they remain vectors after twisting. So nothing changes with the gauge fields. But the scalars originally transformed as a, in the vector representation of the SO2 flavor. So now they become vectors after, under the twisted rotation group. So this in the, generically in these theories, it turns out, when you do this reformulation in terms of twisted variables, all the scales appear as vector-like objects. So what happens is, and again, this is sort of generically true, is that you can rewrite the theory in terms of a complex gauge field, which is a linear combination of the original gauge field and the scalar fields. Right? So this is curly or calligraphic A that appears, and you can rewrite the theory in terms of this calligraphic A. So the bosonic sector can be rewritten as a F, curly F, curly F dagger, and this particular combination of complex covariant derivatives. So these guys just correspond to d mu plus, ah, this should be calligraphic A. Uh, that's a bad typo, right? So this is the, this is the curly A down here, right? So I build the Fs in the normal way with, by taking commutators of now complex covariant derivatives. So it's actually remarkable that the original bosonic theory can be rewritten in this language, and I'll show you that in just a second, right? So although, by the way, although things are complex everywhere, you still only have UN gauge invariants. I haven't changed the gauge symmetry. This is really an F times F dagger. So it's only invariant under the UN gauge group. So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll show you explicitly that, that reduces the original action in just a moment. But let me just say a bit more about the, the original twisted supersymmetries. So I started off with a set of supercharges labeled with a flavor index and a Lorentz index, just like the fermions. So again, they're going to decompose into a scalar piece corresponding to that field eta a vector piece, and a piece uh, proportional to gamma 1, gamma 2. If you take the original supersymmetry algebra and just re-express it in these variables, you'll see that indeed you find that q squared is 0. What else could it be? Right? It has, carries no indices, so it really doesn't have a choice. There can't be a p mu on the right-hand side because there's nothing to contract it with. In fact, what you find is that p mu is the q variation of something else, q mu. So it's q q mu which gives me p mu, and q squared is 0. So that just follows from the original supersymmetry algebra when I re-express those supercharges in terms of these twisted supercharges. Right? So notice, roughly speaking, this tells me that the momentum is Q-exact. So that means that things like the energy momentum tensor, which are products of P's, are also likely Q-exact. Right? If the energy momentum tensor is Q-exact, that's an argument that the whole action is Q-exact, since T is just the variation with respect to the metric of the action. Right. So this is not a proof, but as a plausibility argument, quite generally in these theories, when I can do this twisting operation, the resultant actions can have a Q-exact structure. Right? And I'll show you that. Well, here it is. Here's the action written in Q-exact form. So it involves this curly F contracted with the chi's. There's a piece, there's an auxiliary field D I put in, like that B field originally for quantum mechanics. Uh, so that's a singlet under Q. And it, and it Ada varies into it, so this is just like the quantum mechanical structure I had before, and then this is piece proportional to curly d bar, curly d. So the claim is, that if I take the Q variation of this object, I get the action written in twisted variables, 
which is now automatically invariant under Q because clearly Q squared is zero. So it couldn't be, a, the supersymmetry algebra for Q is extremely simple. It takes curly A into a psi mu. What else could it do? Because Q carries no indices. So you don't have many options for writing down the structure of this at all. Right? It's a very simple operation. And you can see that Q squared is zero now off shell. Right? So Q squared, this is all in the continuum still, but you'll see it's the basis for constructing the lattice theory. So we're in the continuum, Q squared is zero, the action can be written as Q on it, and it's written in terms of these complex field strengths and complex covariant derivatives, and then these anti-symmetric integer spin, if you want, fermions. So it's a reformulation of the continuum theory, which provides a nice jumping off point for constructing the lattice theory. Okay, so let's just show you it's really just a change of variables. There's nothing, no, nothing else going on. So I can integrate out this D field, just like I did in the quantum mechanics case. And I'll find, when I do that, that I get FF bar, this term here, and then here are the fermions. So this is the action I'm going to start with, having integrated out B, D. Okay. Now remember, curly F is a commutator of covariant derivatives, so I can decompose it in terms of the usual F, and then these components, these scalar fields B. Right? So remember that um, curly A is A plus I B, roughly speaking. So if I write F curly F down, which is really curly D, curly D, then it's going to involve terms. I can just take the real parts and get the usual F tensor, but then there'll be derivatives acting on B2 buried inside of it. So I can decompose the curly F in terms of the usual yang mills term, derivatives on B, and then there's also going to be a commutator of B because I'm going to have pieces where I have BB. Right? So the usual structure of the Young extended theory, the, the supersymmetric theory involving commutators of scalars, just naturally emerges when I expand out F, curly F. So I can simply just rewrite curly F in terms of these variables. I can plug it in, and I can do a little integration by parts, and I can get the usual Young Mills term. I'll clearly get the square of this guy. And then I can, and then I can manipulate these derivatives into the form of B box B by an integration by parts, right? At that point, I've recovered my original scalar action. It just looks a little funny because my flavor indices A have become what looked like Lorentz indices B. But physically, that's just a relabeling of the fields, right? So the bosonic action just collapses back to what it was. I just, it's, just, it's just a fancy way of rewriting it, basically. The fermions can also be right. You can take the fermionic action here. I can build spinners out of the chi's, the eta's, the psi 1's, and the psi 2's. I have exactly four degrees of freedom, so I can build precisely two independent real spinners out of it, the two Majorana fermions. I can look at the structure inside of here and just rewrite it as a two-by-two two matrix, and you'll see it's gamma dot d plus some u Yukawa interactions. Those u Yukawa interactions are precisely the ones in the original theory. So while this action at the point, this point, looks very different from my the starting point action, it really is completely equivalent to it in flat space. If I was on a, on a curved manifold, it would not be equivalent because I'm changing the spin of the particles, so I'm changing the coupling to gravity. But in flat space, this is just a re, this is just a relabeling of my original action. It's useful because it has this Q exact structure and it singles out a supersymmetry, which is nilpotent, which I can hope to conserve when I go to a discrete space. Okay. And you know, in fact, that in one of the motivations for Witten to construct topological field theories originally was to come up with a way of building a scalar supercharge, which would allow him to be, write theories down which are supersymmetric on arbitrary curve backgrounds. The lattice, in some sense, is a singular arbitrary curve background. All right. Okay, so, so here's the, strat the general strategy. Oh, yeah. Ten minutes, okay. Um, if the action is going to be Q exact, we can maintain Q invariance if we just maintain the, the subalgebra Q squared equals zero. So we're going to have to keep this, make this true, even when we go to a discrete lattice. That turns out to be quite possible, but it's the, obviously the first point. But the theory also, if it's a gauge theory, has to maintain gauge invariance. It has to avoid fermion doubling. All these original problems I discussed at the beginning have to somehow also be... Um, kind of avoided at the same time as, so it's not just a question of constructing uh, a theory with Q squared equals zero, you have to make sure the theory is still gauge invariant, and it avoids all the standard problems of formulating supersymmetric lattice theories. 
So those actions have been constructed, and I'll show you exactly what that is in just a moment. Uh, in fact, they were first constructed using completely different methods by David and Mitat and his collaborators uh, with Seattle and BU. Okay? Remarkably, the pathway I've just described to you in terms of topological twisting can be used to reproduce exactly the same supersymmetric lattice gauge theories. So that's what the approach I'm going to take, since that's uh, was in my own interest over the years. But, it's, but you should bear in mind that the, these theories were first done using completely different techniques. It right? just turns out that you can get to them by using this topological twisting. And many people have contributed to understanding how these different approaches are related to each other and what the possible spectrum of supersymmetric lattice gauge theories really is. So there are a whole series of names associated with this work uh, over, the, over the years. There's one wrinkle I should... Uh, get back to, which is that the n equals 2 theory I've discussed so far actually has two independent twists, two independent topological twists, two independent changes of variables, which gives you a supercharge which is nil potent. The one I talked to you about, which is actually the B twist, so called B twist, and then a, another twist uh, called the A twist. Um, and in fact, the lattice gauge theory, the n equals 2 theory I've discussed, was first discretized. Uh, in the, using the A-twist by, by Sugino here um, uh, before. So uh, in that case, the square of the supercharge is actually a gauge transformation. What you saw in the construction I went through is that there's no gauge transformation. Q squared is literally zero. If you take the A-twist, then Q squared is just a gauge transformation. So as long as you write an unengaged invariant action, it's still an invariance of the theory. And you can construct a lattice theory using these ideas um, uh, you know, using, uh, in the same way. So these A-twist lattice theories differ in some important respects in the structure of the lattice theory. I won't have time to talk about them, but you should be aware that the, this N equals 2 theory was first discretized using the A-twist, not the B-twist I've described. Okay, so how do we go to the lattice? So I've, everything I've said so far has been in the continuum, and I still have to tell you uh, how we make the transition to the lattice theory. So I start off with a square lattice in 2D. Um, I know where to put the bosons. The bosons should be replaced by some sort of Wilson gauge links. So they're going to live naturally on the links, right? They're spin, they're, they're, they're are one form, so they're naturally associated with the links in the lattice. That's what Wilson told us a long time ago. Remember, I have this transformation, though, now that tells me that this curly Q on the calligraphic A mu has to be psi mu. So if gauge transformations are to commute with my supersymmetry transformations, if this guy lies on a link, then the fermion has to lie on a link too, right? Because this thing is a scalar. So what happens is the fermions also lie on links. So for example, so U1 is, say, this link here going from left to right. Psi1, its superpartner, also lies on that link going in the same direction. So that, that tells me what... Now, eta is a site field... Right? So it naturally lies on a lattice site. So some fermions still live on sites. Yeah? What happens on, remember, we're in the adjoint representation. So typically, any field has to transform with two factors of the gauge group, just like for a Wilson gauge link. So it should go like G, U, G dagger. I'm sorry, but e, before, psi, G dagger. before you did the twist, uh -huh. Two indices, your alpha and A or something, right? Uh -huh. So it was only gauge transformation. On I didn't even write the gauge indices down. Oh, you didn't write them. No, right. there were f discrete flavor indices and Lorentz indices. I didn't even put the gauge, the color labels on there. But your fermions, therefore, have two gauges. The fermions on the adjoint representation of the oh, gauge. Oh, I did. Group. Okay, then then it makes sense putting on the line. Right, right. Thank you. Right. So 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 naturally. They all, you know, if the U field transforms with two factors of the gauge transformation at the beginning and the end of the link, the same will be true for the epsize. Right? They are the super partners, and I want them to, I want Q to commute with the notion of gauge transformation, lattice gauge transformation. You put them on the links. But no. okay. What I'm saying is that supersymmetry forces you to put them on the links here. If you want the gauge fields to live on the links, these complex gauge fields now, then the fermion psi has to also has to line a so, link. But it's, so therefore, it's a little different because it has an independent gauge transformation on the left and right, mm -hmm. whereas the adjoint before you did this thing didn't yep. have two independent gauge transformations. So it's slightly, you see what I'm saying? 
Uh, if I had a I agree adjoint, with what you're saying, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah if I had adjoint, I would have, you know, a mega I'd only I only can't. Gig. It's not obvious how to do something like super QCD where things are in the fundamental. Right. I'll, I'll tell you how to do that in the third lecture. But even the adjoint fermion itself originally had only a single gauge transformation on left and right. I mean, yes, it was an adjoint transformation. In the naive continuum limit, of course, there are... Be, and you say in the continuum it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's how eta transforms. Right. So eta, because it's a site field, has no notion of directionality. It's a zero form. So it should lie in the, on the site. And in fact, the number of exact supercharges is proportional to how many fermions end up living at a site. So in this case, there's just one eta one conserves supercharge, and that just transforms like it would in the continuum for an adjoint field. So the only other choice I have is what to do with the chi-1-2. So it naturally would be associated with the plaquette, but in fact I can just draw in this diagonal link through the plaquette and associate the chi with the diagonal link. So it's also going to be a link fermion. Uh, you notice it's oppositely oriented. Instead of running from x out, it's going to run from the corner point down towards x. That choice of orientation on chi is also crucial for gauge invariance, as you'll see in a moment. So I have a, a, a you'll, you'll, because chi contracts with an f, and the f will turn out to be the, this link path going positively up here. To make a gauge invariant term, the chi has to actually be oriented down. Uh, so it turns out that you always choose the orientations of the fermions to alternate between even and odd forms as you go through the k letter rack field. Right, so it's even, odd, even, odd. So chi is odd-oriented. Okay. And, and it's obvious from the point of view of gauge invariance why that has to be. So roughly speaking, it's a very natural way to map the continuum fields because they're geometrical objects into a lattice by associating with the corresponding p-forms with p-cells. That's a well-known mapping um, that's been discussed for many, many years. Um, and this... All right, so there's... And, okay. But I, I've not finished, really. I mean, I've told you how to map the fields on the lattice, but I haven't told you how to deal with the derivatives. So how do I write down a uh, prescription for derivatives, which is compatible with gauge invariance and Q-symmetry? So it turns out there is a very natural way to do this. Uh, so I can replace continuum derivatives by forward or backward difference operators. They have to be gauged, so they have to involve the U-field. All right. And this is the prescription. So there's a way of doing this for differentiating an arbitrary p-form lattice field uh, in terms of... It. And what happens is, roughly speaking, you end up with a, what looks at first glance like a commutator of the field with this complex gauge matrix, except the arguments are shifted around. So if I set u to 1, which corresponds to setting the gauge coupling to 0, this is just a four difference operator on psi nu. All right? so, um, so it is a derivative operator. Um, if I expand u as 1 plus a, as I would do in QCD, you can show this collapses to the usual covariant derivative for adjoint fields. So it has the right naive continuum limit. It is indeed a difference operator, and it's the structure being d plus is actually important for avoiding fermion doubling, as you'll see. And not only that, but these are both link paths. Right? This takes me from uh, along one link and along the other one. This one is the the, the endpoints of both of these products are the same. So they transform covariantly on the lattice gauge transformations like a link path. That's going to be necessary to make closed loops. Right? So this, yeah? The U is a, yes. yes. It's not from the notation, it's not obvious that the U is, is the joint one. Uh, the U is the, as you'll see, is in the algebra of GLNC. It transforms, uh, yeah, no, I didn't write it down, but yeah, that's right. So, so it turns out the requirements that you have the right naive continuum limit, that you avoid fermion doubling, and that these things, both terms in this, in this derivative transform sort of covariantly like a link path under gauge transformations uniquely determines this prescription. So arbitrary types of derivatives can be written down using those rules, and they always have this general structure that they look, roughly speaking, like a commutator of this complex U field with the field in question, with arguments shifted in order to make them into derivatives. So there's a well-defined prescription for mapping the continuum derivatives into lattice expressions. Not only that is that true, but that will be uh, in such a way that you maintain gauge invariance. So here we go. So, for, so this is just uh, saying this in more detail. So if I look at how this transforms into gauge transformations, it transforms like G U G dagger at the end. Then this psi mu at x plus mu transforms with the same g psi and then a g dagger at the end of this, x plus mu plus nu. 
All right. So these guys go out. This transforms like a link from x to x plus mu plus nu. So this is prescription for derivatives, which allows you to maintain this sort of, oh, all right, I'll finish off in just a second, um, which allows you to maintain the gauge transformation properties of these products. So notice in the action, I have to contract uh, this guy with a chi mu nu. So there's a term in that ladder in the continuum action, which involves the trace, chi mu nu, d mu, psi nu. So we've just been looking at this, and it transforms like a particular link path. I told you before how, where I put the chi on, the, on that diagonal link. So now the orientation is obvious, because then this thing, when I put, port it to the lattice, is the trace of a gauge invariant loop. And that works for all the terms in the action. All right? So it's crucial that U commutes with gauge transformations. And this is ensured by mapping the fermions not on the sites, but on the links, generically. The only fermions that lie on the sites are these fermions like eta, which are associated with exact supersymmetries. Okay, let's see if there's a good spot to finish today. So let me just go through and write down the action and we'll be done for today. Okay, so, if I, so what I can do is I can go back to my uh, continuum action and I can just rewrite it um, using this language. All right, so for example, I can rewrite the fermion action. It looks formally just like the continuum, except I've replaced the continuum derivatives by these particular covariant difference operators. And these fermions lie on particular links. This is now gauge invariant, and it's also supersymmetric because it would be gotten by the Q variation of something. You should notice that actually if you expand out FF bar, it turns out that FF bar contains the usual wilson plaquette operator, plus some other stuff. Right? So it contains everything you already knew. Right. And you already know, by the way, the wilson plaquette operator does not have, exhibit any bosonic doubling. There are no additional states there. Because the fermions are paired by supersymmetry, there can't be any fermion doubles either. All right. So there are other arguments as to why there's no fermion doubling here, but you can partly see it because you can just look inside of this object, see the wilson, ordinary wilson plaquette operator, and realize that the bosonic theory has no doublers. So because the, you've maintained supersymmetry, there can't be fermion doublers either. Turns out that, okay, right, the way. Okay, so let me just finish with this last, uh, this last point here to build up. You might have noticed that when I replaced derivatives by difference operators, I chose either d plus or d minus, right? That is not my choice either, it turns out. If you want to avoid fermion doubling, you have to do it in a particular way. You have to um, replace the derivative in the continuum by a forward difference operator when you're doing a diver uh, when you're doing a curl-like operation, so d mu psi nu. When you're doing a divergence-like operation, like d mu bar psi nu, then it has to be d minus. All right? This guarantees there's no doubling in the discrete theory. And this was worked out by Jeff Rabin, actually, as a consequence of homology theory many, many, many years ago, with very little application in, in lattice QCD until uh, supersymmetric theories came along. So this prescription was worked out a long time ago. So again, my lattice fermions roughly now have this structure. So I have d minuses from divergence operations, so d1 psi 1 plus d2 psi 2. That's one term that contracts with eta. Then I have to use d pluses downstairs to get the curl operations. If I take the determinant of this guy, you'll see I get delta minus delta plus plus delta plus delta minus. That's the doubler free scalar Laplacian. So the determinant of this operator has only one zero at the origin k equals zero. Again, there is no fermion doubling. So that choice wasn't even free. It's, it was in there in order to make sure that the, the spectrum of the fermion operator exhibits no doublers. So these lattice gauge theories get around all the traditional problems. They manage to maintain at least one supercharge. They keep gauge invariance. They avoid fermion doubling in a particular way. Remember, I still have some doubling here. I'm describing two fermions because my original theory had two fermions. But there's no additional lattice artifact doubling. The, con the, the spectrum of the lattice theory goes smoothly over to the spectrum of the continuum theory as I take a to zero. There's no, no, no additional problems, no redundant states that have to decouple or anything like that. It's a smooth transition. And this was all worked out actually a long time ago, not in the context of supersymmetric theories. So this is probably a semi-suitable place to finish since I'm o over time. So I'll continue with this discussion next time and then move on to n equals 4 in four dimensions. And you'll see that the n equals 4 construction is extremely, I mean, once we understand this well, the n equals 4 construction is almost the same. So thanks.
Okay. Uh, would it also be possible to formulate this theory with counter terms? Uh, sure. Yeah, I don't think it's actually been done, as far as I know. Maybe somebody else knows. To actually study that, it should be able to do all of the things I said for quantum mechanics here, too. I mean, this construction exists, so it will be kind of perverse, except to make sure you really understood things, right? So it maybe has some pedagogical value to do that, yeah. And the other question, maybe if you just look at the fermionic derivatives, can you see easily that they avoid fermion doubling, except going through this? Uh, here? No, I mean, there are two arguments. One is you, for a start, you can set uh, the gauge matrices all to one, because the doubling issues don't depend on the interactions. So it's very, so you can go to the fermion operator you, you end up with, replace all the derivatives by either d pluses or d minuses, just ordinary difference operators, and then you'll always see that it has this kind of structure. That, it, that when you take the determinant, things coalesce in such a way that you get a doubler-free sort of scalar Laplacian or powers of it. So I don't, uh, that's one argument. The other argument is if you can show the bosonic sector has no doublers, and if you have exact supersymmetry, then there have to be no extra fermion states either. So there are sort of at least two arguments. There may be, maybe there's some other way of thinking about it too, but yeah, I, I don't know. Those are the two arguments I usually use. Yeah, David. <laughs> Uh, just a comment. Uh, Jeff Rabin's paper ends with sort of a sad note that uh, Lenny Susskind took him aside and showed him that his beautiful homology fermions yeah. could be mapped onto staggered fermions. Right. I have that. And, and, and therefore, time. wasn't a brand new thing. Um, oh, yeah. and so, in fact, yeah. <laughs> so, so, in fact, so in fact, these models Sorry, yeah. are the ones where staggered fermions have the right number of degrees of freedom to be the, right. including all the all the uh, degrees of freedom to be the match for the bosons. Right. Yeah. So it's reduced staggered fermions strictly. Yeah. Right, reduced staggered fermions. But the staggered fermion formulation hides the geometry that makes yeah. the supersymmetry something. This is, Kata Dirac equation, in my opinion, is a much more beautiful way of thinking about staggered fermions than the conventional picture. But they do map one to one, and I'll, I'll sketch that out next time around. Actually. So that, yeah, that's the simple thing. It's like staggered fermions. Except the tastes are physical now. Since you didn't mention about the Q exactness of other supercharge, mm -hmm. I better give a comment that uh, you, of course, know that uh, uh, the n equal to superang mills have a Q, scalar supercharge Q exact, but also exact for all the other supercharges, Q1, Q2, and Q theta. With, oh, the, uh, the lattice constructions or the continuum? I'm talking about the continuum. Yes, uh, sure. Yes. And if you just introduce uh, uh, auxiliary field, one can write for all supercharged Q exact. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. I, that's yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only for scalar, scalar part. Right. So you can always write it as the a, a Q variation on something, but the Q can carry an index itself. That's correct. So you can write as Q mu lambda mu. That's right. Yeah. In the continuum. That's true. 